Ed here with the Digital Digest, and today I wanted to share a quick update on my experience with the Microsoft Surface Pro X. First and foremost, I wanted to make mention of the fact that this is easily one of the most intriguing pieces of hardware that Microsoft has launched in several years. However, it's also one of the most underwhelming, and I'll get to why later in this video. Let's go over pricing and configuration. This 13-inch Windows 10 tablet is driven by a Qualcomm SQ1 ARM processor that Microsoft co-opted with Qualcomm to launch this product. Uh, we've got 8 gigs of RAM, 128 gigs of storage, uh, no storage expansion, no micro SD card slot. You can swap out that SSD. I'm not sure why you would though. And we do have an LTE radio on board capable of gigabit speeds, which is arguably one of the most impressive parts other than the design of this device. 999 US, you heard right, for this base model, and that's without the keyboard, which you will need. Uh, the keyboard uh, pen combo, which I recommend if you jump into this, uh, is 270 US, the same pricing that you'll find for the Surface Pro 7, but we do have a little bit of a redesign, not so much on the keyboard, but the pen, which I'll be showing you a little bit later. So why is this underwhelming? Well, at first glance, it appears to be a step in the right direction, and I do think it's a glimpse into the future of what we will get uh, from Microsoft going ahead, not only in a hopeful uh, you know, successor to the Surface Pro X, but the Surface Pro 8. But here's the thing. I pulled up what I think is a very good example from mspoweruser.com, full credit uh, for this. They put together a spreadsheet of software that will and won't work. And you might be scratching your head already saying, wait a minute, what do you mean will or won't work? It's Windows 10, right? It's a desktop OS. Yes and no. Because we have a Qualcomm processor, which is an ARM processor, which I'm a huge fan of, but you know, it's not the first time, nor will it be the last, that uh, any manufacturer, specifically Microsoft, has tried to implement Windows 10 on top of a mobile chip like this that is ARM-based. You have to remember, it cannot run 64-bit applications. And you can see right here, we have a column dedicated to architecture, right here, native support. And that's because only 32-bit is supported by ARM architecture, which means that developers will have to port 64-bit applications that don't presently uh, exist in the 32-bit realm in order for this tablet to actually run them. So to give you some very straightforward things that you won't be able to do, I'm not talking about video rendering or editing or you know photo editing, those things you can't do on this. And a lot of people immediately say like, what, did you think it was going? No, I didn't, but average consumers that walk in if a salesperson doesn't educate them and make them aware of the difference in architecture, they're gonna buy this assuming they can do those things. So let's just take a quick look. So for example, something simple like Discord. If you're a gamer, you know what that is. It cannot run, okay? Uh, moving beyond that, if you have any interest in the stock market, you see Schwab, Street Mart Edge, you see TD Ameritrade, Thinkorswim, these things can't run. So that's another big problem, okay? It's something where those are the type of things I expect out of the box to work with this. In fact, I'm not sure what Microsoft was thinking to not make sure that they could get ported versions of that sort of uh, financial uh, software basically native to a product like this because that's who I think this will appeal to primarily. I mean, we have a 3 by 2 13-inch display that is great for you know, consumption uh, and business work and yet, business work outside of Microsoft Office, I'm sort of scratching my head. I mean, if you're going to buy this just to go over your email and watch videos in Letterbox, you've lost it a little bit. Or you've been duped. Okay, so things like Skype work, great. You know, that's fantastic. Uh, but moving down the list, you'll see other things like, in terms of utilities, you know, yes, Flipboard and Firefox both work. But then you've got a whole host of different software, including just Dropbox, that does not work unless you go over to the Windows Store, I believe, and I haven't tried it on here yet, and get it that way. Now, in terms of games, you do have things like GTA San Andreas working, and that's nice, and Minecraft, congratulations. But then get into other ga games, and these are not new games, okay? They don't work. Diablo 2, Diablo 3, StarCraft Remastered, uh, the list goes on. And there are, are a lot more to list than what's on this list. This is just what, again, was compiled by MS Power User, and I think this is really smart. I think this is something Microsoft should have done from the very beginning to essentially make it clear to consumers, yeah, Skype is going to work, uh, but 
you know, a lot of other things aren't. Yes, you know, Office is going to work, but don't expect to run that software that your bank of choice in, you know, for trading stock is going to be able, you know, that's not going to run. Um, and that's a big miss on what I think is a perfect machine for business users and that has the power for business users, but doesn't have the software support. And that's not Microsoft's fault, but the onus is on Microsoft to create that adoption. So what's my advice on this? It's pretty straightforward. I mean, if Microsoft wanted to do this right, pricing would have been the first thing that they would have consulted. Rather than launching at a base price of $999, make the top of the line spec $999 or a little over $1,000. And then I think Microsoft has the right approach. If they would have started this product around six or 700 US, they would have had a really solid chance of putting these devices in homes in spite of the software limitations that it has. Because no one's gonna buy this just to browse the web. And if you are, you're getting taken. Even if you're okay with it, this isn't gonna help the marketplace evolve or revolutionize anything. To me, this is kinda like the first Xbox uh, and subsequently the second and the third. They needed to sell this at a loss because the goal here has to be, if you think there's going to be a future for this platform, get it into as many hands as possible because that is the only way that developers are gonna jump on board and start making ports for all of that software that cannot run on ARM natively. You know, emulation is great and it works well here. I mean, when I was just in Chrome, I've shown it before, I'll do it again right now. If you jump onto YouTube, it works great. I mean, you browse the web, it works very well. You even have, as I mentioned, that gigabit LTE connection, which means this thing has internet everywhere. You're not you know, stuck on, or I should say, you're not a prisoner of Wi-Fi. You can do whatever you want. So I'll go ahead and just uh, put in 4K. I did this the other day in my comparison, and this machine does a great job. The problem really is that, again, this has to be able to run software. Speakers are good, the display is good, form factor is great. I think this is the future of where things are going. I'll even bump it up to 4K, even though the display is not 4K native. It's roughly 3K, almost. A little bit of buffering. It looks great, right? But I think that's really the story here, is that the Surface Pro X looks great. But it isn't great. And that's why I say this is more promising as a glimpse into the future of what we'll likely see down the road but this isn't really the product of today because if you purchase this, if you go all in and you spend $1,300 on this combination, because after tax, it'll be more than that, you still will have less functionality than the $300 PicaGo, this UMPC tiny clamshell two-in-one. And that is scary because even though the PicaGo is not as fast, won't operate as quickly as this, it won't be as snappy, You'll never hit that wall where things aren't going to install. I'm not rhyming intentionally, I promise. And that's a big deal. I mean, as nice and as polished as this is from an external standpoint, the internals are as rusty as could be. And I don't mean the RAM or the SSD, I'm talking about the Qualcomm SQ1. And from a battery life standpoint, it also doesn't run circles around its Intel Brethren in the Surface Pro 7. If you miss that comparison, it nearly has the same battery life. It's a little bit more battery life, but not enough, especially when taking into account that you will not be able to run the software that you likely plan to. And I know there are plenty of you out there that understand the limitations of the ARM architecture, and you'll probably write stupid comments telling me that I don't understand it, but I'm talking to people that have no idea that are gonna walk in and be, I hate to say it, fooled. And I don't think that necessarily Microsoft Store employees are trying to fool anyone. I think they're, in most cases, just as ill-equipped as everyone else on marketing this product. It's a tough one to market. And that's why I believe Microsoft, if they would have come in at a much lower price point, it's even how the original Surface Pro began before they started making it more and more expensive and taking things away like the pen that was always included. Um, you know, they started cutting corners and making more money. And that's what companies do. If they would have taken that approach with this, I think it's a completely different story. So you get the idea now on what this represents. Great tablet, 
but limited in many ways because it is running Windows 10. Had it been a dual boot system that could have, you know, also given you an Android or iOS experience, I know iOS is never happening, but Microsoft's already partners with Google uh, on the Duo, the phone they're introducing next year, I would bet any amount of money this thing may be a Android experience next year if this is a flop. And I do think it's going to be a flop. Uh, it's not that it's not nice and it doesn't have promise, but what I've explained through the course of this video, which is software compatibility, that's a really big problem for a PC. And at the end of the day, this is a PC. Even if it's a 13-inch tablet, it's a computer. It's not being marketed as anything else. And it works really well. I think the SQ1 is a fantastic chip. The benchmarks are evidence of that. But you're never going to see that in your day-to-day -day experience because things are going great and then you try to install something that should be a no-brainer and guess what? It doesn't happen. You can't do it. So where do you turn next? Unfortunately, that's going to be to another machine. And Microsoft, I know that they knew this. They should have been able to see it coming. And what that equates to is that I mean, everything is working beautifully. And at first glance, I mean, if all I did was talk about web browsing, this would be the best tablet on the market. But that's not what this is all about, right? This is about a lot more. Ugh. So close that out. I don't want to look at that anymore. But overall, really nice machine. Uh, the inking experience, there's the pen if you were waiting for it. Now you see it. Um, I really like the new pen. I think it's a great redesign. I think the fact that it charges in here is smart, not that that's a new thing. Um, the inking experience has been good. I showed this awful sketch of mine the other day, which was just a quick, you know, me just playing with it, my eight-year-old uh, drawing skills. But it does really well. And I think that the Carpenter, Carpenter excuse me, style pen is the best one they've ever made. Some people don't agree with that. Well, tough noogies. But this type cover, as much as I like the way they designed it, the reality is, and this is early on, I mean, it might change, see it's charging, the little white light came on, that because it is magnetic there, we've got a lot more flex in the keyboard. Can you see that? I don't know if you can or you can't, I'll see it once I review the video, but it's got more flex than the Surface Pro 7 signature type cover, and that's not a good thing. So, I mean, it's not awful, it still works well, but the, the amount of flex that lives here is more than you get with the Surface Pro 7 if you're used to that type cover that's that uh, launched uh, last year, then you're going to be not disappointed, but not accustomed to this much movement in this type cover. The beauty of the type cover always was, was that even though it was just a piece of fabric with a mechanical keyboard built in, which was already a feat, it felt like it was solid. Now, not as solid here on the Pro X. Now don't get me wrong, Microsoft has time to improve this, but that is the state of affairs right now with the Pro X here towards the end of 2019, right as it launched on November 5. So I like it, it's a nice machine, uh, built well, Windows Hello works exactly as it should, front and rear cameras are solid, the fact that you have, of course, storage expansion right here, that, not expansion, excuse me, that you can actually replace the SSD is again a glimpse into the future of what I think Microsoft is going to do. Uh, two Type-C ports, of course no Thunderbolt, this is a Qualcomm chip, your volume rocker, nothing along the top, and then power, and the Microsoft uh, charging terminal for their proprietary brick. It's just a really nice tablet. The problem is ARM needs to start to be fleshed out for Windows. And I feel like Microsoft, if they would have brought the price down, I would be complaining less about this. So would every other reviewer on earth. They wouldn't just be talking about how nice it is. They'd be talking about how we can have patience because it didn't cost as much as the Surface Pro 7 or other competing computers. That's it for today. Any questions or comments, please feel free to post them. Hit that like button. And as usual, please feel free to subscribe. Later.